Good morning. Good morning. It's good to see everyone today. Did you see the sunrise this morning? Did you see it out there? It came, didn't it? I was out there in my backyard and uh, uh, just enjoying the sun. And today is a beautiful day, a gift of life. And I'm grateful to worship with you this morning. So today is our last day in this series of appointed times. And um, it has been such a blessing to me, a, convict, a very convicting series, at least personally for me, to see that God does have appointed times. And what once served as reminders to people of events have now turned into this prophetic foreshadowing of God. And it's such a beautiful thing. So I want to brag on God this morning a little. This is the Paradise Tanager. And uh, the Paradise Tanager is such a beautiful bird. If you are into bird watching, it's one of those birds that you want to cross off your list because it's just, it is simply beautiful. It is a, it has a light green head, sky blue underparts, and a black upper body plumage. Depending on the subspecies, the behind is yellow and red or all red. And if you look real close at the head of this bird, it's almost like a green shag rug. <laughs> it's, it's really, isn't it amazing? It is incredible. So we're looking at the eternal power and divine nature in, the, in his creation. Father, we just want to come to you this morning and I want to pray. Father, I just want to pray that you <clears throat> are glorified today in what we do. Lord, I pray for each one who's here that's, that's present, those that are not with us this morning. I pray, Father, for, for parents who are struggling with their children. Father, I pray for those who are dealing with loved ones who are struggling in their health. Father, I pray for those who are wrestling with a battle within internally and doubts and, and, and frustrations, Lord, that nobody can see. Father, I pray for Your, your protection this morning against the warfare of distraction as we talk about the last appointed time. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So this series started in Colossians. In Colossians 2, it talks about the festivals, the feast, and how they serve as a shadow this concept that these original appointed times of God serve a pur more than one single purpose. They serve as a shadow, the substance being Christ. So there's fulfillment in all of these feasts that we've been discussing week by week. Seven appointed times, the feast of the Lord, holy days, holidays, holy days. So today is the last feast. It is the Feast of Tabernacles or the Feast of Booths, or Sukkot. And this feast is such an amazing feast. I really wish that we, maybe we should start practicing this feast. It's a fun one. It's, it really is incredible. So this is a feast where they build temporary shelters. I'm in. I'm in already. Okay, just using nature using what's available, building shelters, your imagination. Let's go. They would decorate with greenery and fruits, a seven-day celebration. Man, I, I really do love this feast for many reasons that you'll hear in this sermon, but there's these temporary living spaces. And I think that there's something about temporary living spaces that like, we, our mind can go somewhere that is beneficial for us. How many of you have ever set up a tent in your backyard? Okay, like you could literally just step and take 10 steps and be right inside a house. But no, we're in the backyard camping in this temporary place. And there's something about that temporary place that affords you something that your house can't. Okay, I love tree houses. I've always loved tree houses. It's this different habitation that you can go to where imagination can take over. It can become anything and everything. And there's something it affords that you can't have at your house. How many of you are more the temporary shelter type of people that, hey, I'll stay in a hotel, okay? Forget that tent in the backyard stuff, right? But there's something different when we, we, we kind of get out of our, 
our, our, our habitation and we, we take a break and experience something different. And so let's read about it. This is in Levit- Leviticus 23. We're going to be reading about this last feast. In Leviticus 23, starting in verse 33. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the people of Israel, saying, uh, saying On the fifteenth day of the seventh month, and for seven days is the feast of booths to the Lord. On the first day shall be a holy convocation. You shall not do any ordinary work. For seven days you shall present food offerings to the Lord. On the eighth day you shall hold a holy convocation and present a food offering to the Lord. It is a solemn assembly. You shall not do any ordinary work. So you have the first day of rest, the last day of rest, and in between is this feast of celebration that we'll be learning about. Picking back up in verse 37, these are the appointed times of the Lord, which you shall proclaim as times of holy convocation for presenting to the Lord food offerings, burnt offerings, and grain offerings, sacrifices, and drink offerings, each on its proper day, besides the Lord's Sabbath, and besides your gifts, and besides all your vow offerings, and besides all your free will offerings, which you give to the Lord. Verse 39, on the 15th day of the seventh month, when you have gathered in the produce of the land, so I'll pause here, this is also known as the Feast of Ingathering in the Old Testament. So it is also a feast that is in correlation with their agriculture, and it is the last harvest. We had a a spring harvest, a summer harvest, and now this is the fall harvest. So gather all the produce in the land. You shall celebrate the feast of the Lord seven days. On the first day shall be a solemn rest. On the eighth day shall be a solemn rest. And you shall take on the first day the fruit of splendid trees. Doesn't that sound nice? The fruit of splendid trees, branches of palm trees, and boughs of leafy trees, and willows of the brook. And you shall rejoice before the Lord your God seven days so here they are the end of the harvest they're gathering their produce they're having this seven day feast in these temporary shelters and i spent quite a bit of time just thinking about what does that look like what does it mean to rejoice before the lord your god rejoice before the lord your god what would that look like if we decided to have an event here today and the, the main purpose of this event is that we're going to be rejoicing before the Lord for seven days. I'll tell you what, I'm not going to be in a seat the whole time, right? When I thought about what does it look like to rejoice before the Lord, the thing that came to my mind is being seen by a loving Father. Um, I thought of times past where our boys were much younger and in a moment, we could have an instant dance party. They dance party, and they would throw out the most ridiculous moves, so silly in their nature, but uninhibited. But they understood that they were, they were rejoicing. They were having a good time in front of their parents and loved them. To rejoice before the Lord your God. Seven days. We'll continue in verse 41. It says, You shall celebrate it as a feast of the Lord for seven days in the year. It is a statute forever throughout your generations. You shall celebrate it in the seventh month. You shall dwell in booths for seven days. All native Israelites shall dwell in booths that your generations may know that I made the people of Israel dwell in booths when I brought them out of the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. So this is a historical reminder of when they, the Egyptian slaves were brought out of Egypt and they had to stay in these temporary booths. It's a historical reminder, but it is also a prophetic visual of the end of age, a change in habitation. Have you ever heard or experienced that change, everything in life can change in a day? Do you agree with that? Everything in life can change in a day. And I think there's two ways that that people tend to think about this. The first thing is something that is circumstantial that changes everything for you. 
You know, whether it is a loss, whether it is a, um, you lose your job, whether um, something traumatic happens in your life and, and everything can change in a day. There's another kind of change that can happen in a day and it has everything to do with your perspective. Resting in the Lordship of Jesus that, okay, I've given and surrendered everything to you and now in a moment, everything in life can change because you're resting in His ability to watch, to care for you. This, this feast represents change they went from their normal dwelling places into these temporary dwelling places this is the second feast that is a seven day visual of trans their transformation teachers seven days if you remember the feast of unleavened bread right for seven days they were to completely purge out all leaven Right? They couldn't partake in any leaven. They couldn't um, store any leaven. They couldn't be in the proximity of leaven. It was this teacher of the absolute removal of leaven. How can you do that with leavened bread? You can't make leavened bread unleavened. You can't do it. But it's a representation of what happened in the grave. When Jesus was in the grave, there was not only a body in the grave, but our sin was being transformed in the tomb with him sin transformed into perfection so this seven day celebration the one of tabernacles is a teacher about dwelling places a transformation of our dwelling place so imagine that we're them we're experiencing the feast of tabernacles this is where my imagination goes and gets excited about this feast so you like camping out Anybody? Okay, maybe you've got certain spots that you like to go to. Imagine camping out around the house of God. The literal house of God. Thousands upon thousands of booths surrounding the house of God. You know, I imagine at night, you know, you just look out and there's just the, all the twinkling of all the campfires and all of the people's booths. They're celebrating they're rejoicing before the Lord. There's fellowship. There's got to be dancing. <laughs> it would have been a great time. Seven days. The spirit of this feast is really of joy. Rejoicing before the Lord. It's also a marker. It's a marker of the harvest. The final harvest. The final harvest of the year is a shadow of the final harvest of mankind. Jesus says in, in Matthew chapter 9, He's proclaiming the Gospel. He's healing every disease. He looks at the crowds with compassion. And He says they're like sheep without a shepherd. And He says this, The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into the harvest. Jesus lets us know that the harvest that is of God is not of grain, but it is of the souls of men. Jesus also shares this parable of the kingdom of heaven. This is in Matthew 13. And he, and he says that there's this man, there's a good man, he goes out and plants good seed, but then in the night an evil man comes and he plants bad seed. And what happens is there's wheat in their tares. And you can see on the screen, they look very familiar and they start growing up together. And so the servant goes to the master and says, who planted this? What should we do? He thinks maybe we need to pull them out. And he says, no, because if you pull them out, you're going to risk pulling out the wheat. And so the strategy is we're going to wait till the harvest. And at the harvest, we'll separate the weeds or the tear from the wheat. The, the tares, the, the weeds, they'll be burned. The wheat... They will be stored in, in the master's barn. When he was asked what this parable means, in uh, Matthew 13, verse 37, he says this, The one who sows the good seed is the Son of Man. The field is the world. And the good seed is the sons of the kingdom. The weeds are the sons of the evil one. And the enemy who sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age and the reapers are angels 
The harvest is the end of the age. And so here we have this feast that represents the harvest of the end of the age. So there's a couple Jewish uh, traditional elements that were added on, like many of the other feasts, that I want to share with you today. Um, and the reason is, is because they intersect with the life of Jesus. So the first tradition that they uh, celebrated was a water libation ceremony. So every day, the high priest or someone that he would appoint would go down to the pool of Siloam with a golden pitcher and he would fill it up and he would come back to the altar and he would make one circuit around the altar and then he would pour the water, this visual of water on the altar to God. Why? This is the last harvest. The, uh, the seventh month, geographically for them, was the beginning of the rainy season. So they're celebrating the last harvest. God, you've been faithful in the spring harvest, in the, fall, in, in the summer harvest, in the fall harvest. Now we look to you to provide us again. And so they would they'd do this each day. They'd get the pitcher. They would take it to um, the Pool of Siloam. And they would pour this out before the Lord. It was a visual prayer. They didn't go to cisterns. There were cisterns in, in Jerusalem, massive ones that would hold millions of gallons of water. Problem with that water, sometimes stagnant water can become contaminated. They didn't go to wells. Wells are better, but wells can dry up. They went to the Pool of Siloam. And the thing that's interesting about the Pool of Siloam is that it is spring-fed. There was actually a tunnel that Hezekiah built, which is amazing architecture. This is like eight centuries before Christ. A tunnel that went to the Gihon Springs. Okay? It is living water. If you've ever been to Green Cove Springs or another spring, you look at the water, you can see it's moving. It's living water. They would pour this living water upon the altar asking for God's future provision. The other ceremony that they practice was called the temple lighting ceremony and this took place on the final day of the feast and this sounds like a lot of fun they had these giant menorahs they accessed by ladders okay they would have the priest who would um go up on the ladders and keep replenishing the olive oil for these big lamps and then here's this is the, the best part the elders of the sanhedrin would do a torch dance all night can you imagine that i think of these these elders of the sanhedrin who are like i don't know more reserved or you know they're more proper but no they're involved in this torch dance before the lord exciting things taking place on this last day so the levites they played the temple flutes the trumpets the harps it was a big deal so this day that final day is called hashanah rabbah and so that's when the lighting ceremony took place on this last day of the Feast of Tabernacles. And then the water libation ceremony on that last day was different too. So instead of coming and doing one circuit around the altar, they would do seven. Instead of the, the daily three blasts of the trumpet, they would do three sets of seven blasts of the trumpet on this final great day of this Feast of Harvest. So here's where it intersects with Jesus. In John chapter 7 and verse 2, now the Jews' feast of booths was at hand. Well, well, well. Here we are. And Jesus, at this time, his unbelieving brothers are telling him, hey, come to the feast. You know, show your signs. Let people see who you are. And Jesus says, it's not my time. But then he later comes and joins them. And then... Look what we read in John 7, verse 37. On the last day of the feast, the great day, the day where they're making this water libation ceremony, the lighting ceremony, Jesus stood up and cried out, If anyone thirsts, let him come to Me and drink. Whoever believes in Me, as the Scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Man, this must have been like Jesus is really stealing the thunder in this moment. 
Here they are, they're recognizing God's been so faithful in their harvest, this final harvest. Now, God, please continue your provision. Here's the living waters. And here Jesus says, he makes a claim that belief can produce in you living waters. He says, whoever believes in me, as the Scripture said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water flowing from your heart, your soul. What does that look like? Living waters flowing from your heart, your soul. Um, Michelle and I were talking, oh, a week and a half ago or so, and we were just, you know, kind of checking in with your, you know, how you doing your spiritual journey? What's the Lord working on? And, And one of the things that I shared with Michelle is that I just feel like I've been through a time where I haven't, I haven't experienced kind of a physical sense of God's presence in my life that I've been so blessed by um, in my life so many times and just kind of a hunger for that. And uh, can I tell you something this morning? God's faithful and He's good. So this past week I was on a walk and um, basically uh, in a nutshell my experience was that the belief, belief in my soul of His work in my spirit actually manifested in electricity in my body. I felt it. And it was real. And man, I, I teared up. I welled up. And guess what? That day, I was such a better husband, <laughs> better father, better neighbor. It was the living waters that were flowing from my soul that was accessible by belief. Believe in me in in you will become this source and will flow living waters out of your heart. I think it looks a little bit like that. I was waiting. um, So also this week, Michelle and I, we went to Whole Foods and um, we had to do like an Amazon return. And so Michelle had to go to the bathroom and so I'm sitting around waiting at these tables and all of the tables... All of the tables had these signs posted. It was completely empty. There's tape. They were, these signs were everywhere. And you see what it says. It says, seating reserved for Whole Foods market customers. Please no loitering. So here I am waiting around. I'm an inquisitive guy. I like the etymology. I like to research things. So I pull out my phone. I look up loitering. I know what it means, but I want to dig in this. Loitering. Loiter. Stand or wait around idly or without apparent purpose. And I just started laughing because I thought there should be a picture of me right now to help define this. I'm literally leaning over the table with my phone out, standing by idly with no apparent purpose. And it struck me. It struck me in that moment. And I didn't know exactly how to, what to take from that. But after that, I really feel that, so, so I had curiosity of something that I was in the act of doing, right? And I think sometimes we, we think that uh, thinking that I, I needed more knowledge of something that I had complete access to of an experience. And I think that's what we have available to us with the living waters within us. It's not that we need more knowledge, that we already have access to it through belief. And when I was on that walk, I wasn't just mindlessly walking that day. I was engaging with God, believing His work in me. And as I believe the work that He's done in me, the living waters can flow from your heart. So, Jesus stands up after they're doing this water libation ceremony and He says, if you're thirsty, come to Me. This bold claim. No, but this would have not been missed by anybody. What Jesus is trying to connect here. And then verses 39 through 8, 11. It's the story of Jesus and the adulterous woman that's caught. And um, you'll notice in your Bible, there's footnotes. Um, some of the manuscripts place this at different places. And I think that's probably right. Because when we pop back in in chapter 8, verse 12, it fits into the context of this feast. It says this, again Jesus spoke to them saying, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. 
Think about this. They are getting ready for this great, amazing lighting ceremony. They're getting the oils pre- prepped and ready. The, the elders of the Sanhedrin are practicing their moves for their dance, uh, for their torch dances. I mean, this is a big deal. And here Jesus says that he is the light of the world. The cause of not experiencing the living water's flow in your life, I believe, is that you need more light. You need more revelation, understanding of what God has already done in you, in your spirit. When we talk about walking in light or walking in dark, darkness, it can mean both our actions, like I walk in light by my actions or walk in darkness, but it also can mean the revelation that we have. Revelation changes our actions. Darkened understanding leads to dark walking. We'll go to that next slide. Enlightened understanding leads to light walking. So, for me as a kid, I, I wanted to buy some new shoes because I believed that they would help me jump higher. I wanted to purchase uh, the cologne that was the cologne because I thought that it would you know, give me more confidence. I wanted to buy some certain clothes because I felt like that would give me more boldness. And it wasn't in those items that produced those things, but it was the belief in those things that helped produce those. When we understand and have the revelation of what Jesus has already done within you, within your spirit, that light can produce the living waters to flow from your soul. The Holy Spirit has sealed and kept me. And when I forget that, I'm in darkness. And the living waters don't flow. When I have the understanding, the revelation, the light of what He has done, the waters begin to flow. So Jesus understood the light that they knew. What they were practicing here in this lighting ceremony was really a reenactment. So in 1 Kings 8 and 2 Chronicles 7, you can read about the dedication of the temple. Of, you know, Solomon built this temple. It was basically a moving day for God. It went from the, the tent of meeting of God that was made out of animal skins to a more permanent structure made of stone. And on this day, it was during the feast in the seventh month, they moved the items from the tabernacle into the temple. Okay, so they took them out. They took... Everything that was in the the tent of meeting, they moved it into the temple. There was countless sacrifices. A cloud filled the temple. The glory of the Lord filled the house of the Lord, so much so that the priests had to leave the presence because God was there. And guess what? They celebrated seven days. The Feast of Booths. So not only is this a historical event of the wilderness, but it is also historical event of the move of God from the tabernacle to the temple. Moving day for God. From a temporary tent to a permanent stone building. So tabernacles foreshadows our moving day. And I want to talk about that a little bit with you this morning. In Revelations 21, 1 through 2, it says this. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. Verse 3 says, And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place. This word is tabernacle, skene. The tabernacle of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people. And God himself, are you ready for this, brothers and sisters? (laughs) Because I am. This is the tabernacle of God. And God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. And death shall be no more. 
Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. Our moving day, after the final harvest, is into the tabernacle of God. I want to use some more teachings of Jesus to get us thinking. Jesus says this in, in John 14, 1 through 3. He says this Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again. And I will take you to Myself, that where I am, you may be also. The many rooms within the Father's house. So if we follow the presence of God, we can see in the tent of meeting, on the Day of Atonement, one high priest would enter and sanctify for the physical presence of God, sanctify the flesh, purify the flesh, Go into that holy place, which was really just a shadow, a copy of the true tent. That Jesus, our high priest, entered the greater and more perfect tent, entered through the eternal spirit into the heavenly places of the human spirit. That we are the temple of God. We are the house of God. God living in our spirit. Do you believe that? Do you believe that we are the temple of God? That God's presence is now within the human spirit? The end of the age, guess what, is moving day. The end of this age is moving day within the Father's house. I'm going to leave you with this in Revelation 21. At the end of that chapter, in verse 22, it says, And I saw no temple in the city, for its temple is the Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb. And the city has no need of sun or moon to shine in it, for the glory of God gives it light. And its lamp is the Lamb. Jesus is the Passover Lamb. In the grave, what was leavened became unleavened in our spirit. The resurrection is the first fruits of our resurrection. Pentecost is the Spirit's indwelling into leaven hearts. The trumpets will sound unexpectedly, just as they had to anticipate and see that moon. So is the unexpected nature of His return, and trumpets will sound. Are you ready? The atonement will come to Israel when the harvest of the Gentiles is complete. And guess what? At the end of this age, it's moving day. And when I think about that, I can't fully explain to you what moving day will be like, but I believe the foreshadow of the feast is going to be a lot of celebrating. So I'm going to ask our praise team to come up here, and we're going to praise, we're going to celebrate today, because a moving day is going to be such an amazing experience in the many rooms of our Father's house. Father, we just want to come to you this morning, and I pray that that this, this understanding, that this, this foreshadowing of moving day, Father, can equip us in a new way, can encourage us in some way. Father, I pray that we will understand that what we experience now is the house of God, that Your Spirit indwells, Lord, is, is something that changes everything in a day. Then we understand that we are the place that You reside in, Father. It can change our life completely. But Father, when we think and we anticipate the final harvest, when all is done, we will move into the Father's house. We just can't wait. Lord, we love you. And we ask that you would be pleased with our worship and our celebration now. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. If you need to respond to the Lord, we're here for you. Let's stand and sing.